Wonderful. I'm Thanks. unmuted now. Thank you. So I'm very uh, grateful to be here this morning on uh, a beautiful day in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, no winter, however, and that is um, something we have marked for 30 years as uh, the winter weather has transformed uh, during Rohatsu session as we've uh, passed through the years and used to be snow and ice and now it's uh, sunshine. Um, we love sunshine, but not now. So I'd like to invite us to take a few moments to just bring our attention to the body. And wherever you are, let your body relax. Let it be at ease. And invite your breath deep into your body. And we often use this physical metaphor of strong back, which is our capacity for equanimity and soft front, our capacity for compassion and the interdependence of the two. So touch into strong back, soft front. And remember really why you're here. which is to meet the great difficulties of our era with compassion and strength. So thank you. This morning, um, we want to explore some rich perspectives on John Lewis's vision of good trouble. Um, how do we make good trouble in uh, our uh, very unusual time we're in? And how do we collaborate? How do we advocate? How do we translate and educate? And we want to look at some uh, important tools for building beloved communities of action, both locally and globally. And I hope that in the course of this micro training, um, which is the fourth in a series in the socially engaged Buddhist training, but because of Christiana's uh, extraordinary work as a climate diplomat, um, we have opened it to the Maha Sangha. So thank you for joining us, friends. And we want to touch into not just thinking outside of the box, to quote Christiana, but actually let's get rid of the box altogether. And we're going to be looking at some key lessons that we explored in the socially engaged Buddhist training, in addition to some other important lessons that we hope you'll carry out into the world. And those lessons include the three tenets that Glassman Roshi shared with me so many years ago on what is it to sit with not knowing, what is it to bear witness as the foundation for compassionate action. We're also going to touch into briefly the Cartman Triangle of uh, perpetrator, victim, rescuer, and how to get off that tri triangle as we meet situations of great polarization. We're going to be viewing things through a systems approach to transformation and using the Buddhist perspectives of interdependence and impermanence as a way to cultivate a mindset that makes it possible for us to meet 
this world with high adaptivity. We also want to touch into the role of practice in social action. How can we be a contemplative and also an activist? And we're going to look at the role of imagination in this process of transformation that we are part of and the power of compassion and a dedicated practice in meeting our world. So Christiana. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Roshi Joan. Thank you, Noah, both of you for the invitation to join you today. I'm thrilled that we are all getting together from many different parts of the world. Um, I am likely, but I cannot guarantee this, I'm likely the only one who is joining you from the wild and wonderful country of Costa Rica, which is my home country. Um, and it is, we, we only have, Roshi was talking about the four seasons that you all have in the global north. In Costa Rica, we have only two seasons, the rainy and the dry, and we're just at the end of the rainy seasons, which means it is absolutely glorious here because everything is green, everything is blooming, the sun is out, the ocean is blue, and all the plants are green. It is absolutely a glorious day. So my First, uh, my first message here is how absolutely blessed and uh, and 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 truly, truly, um, generously blessed by the abundance of nature and how nature changes throughout uh, throughout the seasons even though she is now changing in different ways as um, Joan has spoken. Anyway, thank you for the invitation and hello from Costa Rica. So um, as Roshi Joan has said, we're going to be going uh, through a couple of areas of exploration. In fact, if time is with us and if Roshi and I are good about time management. At least we have high ambitions for our time together to go through five areas of exploration. We shall see if we can um, actually do that without rushing through any of them. But the five areas of exploration that we would like to invite you to consider is first the power of words. How do we use words uh, more intentionally with more meaning attached to them? And we will talk about that one first with, uh, with uh, a couple of examples. We will then go to a second exploration, which is deep listening, one of my absolute favorite practices. Um, how do we deeply listen, certainly to ourselves, but also to others and above all, to others with whom we don't agree or we don't have much in common? How do we, through our listening abilities, build bridges um, that take us outside of our little bubbles? The third area of exploration uh, is one about how do we bridge divides uh, between those who uh, would perhaps pursue different outcomes than what we are pursuing in full knowledge of the fact that we are all actually on the same planet, that everything is interrelated and interacting as we speak and in every moment. And so how do we go from the myth and the, um, the uh, unhelpful uh, thinking of polarization into much more of a collaborative mindset? The fourth is going to be about um, goal orientation or goal attachment. If we have a particular outcome or a particular goal that we're working toward, we know that we do not have control. Um, and so what happens if the appointed time comes or the appointed uh, goal and, and we have not reached exactly what we were intending? What happens with that moral remainder and how do we deal with that? And finally, uh, just to close that circle, we wanted to explore further compassion, uh, especially when the odds are all against ourselves and all against our compassion. So those are five areas of exploration. And what we're going to 
do is that Roshi Join or I will be sharing one example in each of these five areas of exploration, one example that we have lived through and, um, and exploring that in a little bit of depth and then inviting you to see if you can also touch some experiences that you have had or are having that relate to the particular exploration that we're in and, um, and see if we can share that with everyone else. We will be having between the third and the fourth um, exploration, we'll be having a little break just so that you know that, uh, that, that we have a little biological break there, stretch our feet. Um, stretch our legs, and then we will be coming together again. Um, and um, all, all being as, as planned, we will be finishing punctually to be respectful of the time that you have generously reserved on a beautiful Sunday for you. Roshi? Yeah, so let's just take a breath. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christiana, <laughs> the plain blessing. Take a breath. Remember where you are. Recall where you are right now. And find your seat. Find that place of stability and strength. And the breath deep in the body. Thank you, Christiana. Ah, you're muted. Sorry, that must have been the system itself. Okay, thank you. Um, so friends, let's start with language because um, at, at least from my perspective, and the only thing that I'm gonna be sharing today is my perspective. I'm, I'm not a Dharma teacher as Roshi Joan is, so I'm just gonna be sharing little experiences. But from my perspective, we tend to think that we, uh, we speak after we think. Um, and that there is a coherence between uh, what we're saying and what we're thinking behind the words that we use. And my observation over time has been, actually, it's not just like that. There is a, a, a cycle between what we say and what we think. And very often we have fallen into a habit of using words or metaphors or phrases that convey uh, certain thoughts or actions that we actually may not condone at all, but we're still using those, those phrases and those metaphors. And they may actually be having an unintended but very powerful consequence and impact on the world out there where we all operate in. So let me um, let me just give you an example of why uh, we think that it's important in our social action to be aware of speech. For me, speech is social action in and of itself because of its many impacts. And the words that we use um, really communicate our our attitude, many times our blind biases that we don't intend, but there are there is a lot that is communicated. And so my favorite example is when I was um, put in charge of the climate change negotiations 700 years ago, um, I found that those who were working on this, understandably, because it is an overwhelming challenge, we're using um, very aggressive language, language such as we're here to fight against climate change or we're here in a war on pollution. Um, and, uh, language like that, that was militaristic, aggressive. Um, and I thought, really, is that what we're really, it, is, is the sense that we're bringing to this one of fighting and aggression? Or is it actually that we're bringing our love, our understanding, our compassion to this extraordinary challenge? 
And if we are convinced, as I hope that we all are, that actually it is through the power of love, compassion, deep listening, that we can have most of our impact and our our most um, our highest impact on the world, then our language ought to reflect that and not fall into inadvertent use of language. So I actually had the secretariat um, team that I was working with actually do a search and uh, and replace in all the texts that were out there with fighting against something or a war on this, all of this militaristic negative, negative language and change it. So we don't have to fight against climate change. How about we address climate change? <laughs> Um, very different mentality. And it is not only there, I would dare say, just to bring it down to our daily, uh, daily experience, we use so many other expressions. Well, one of the ones that I have definitely eradicated from my vocabulary, and I invite you all to think about whether you really want to continue using this expression that we've used for decades is killing two birds with one stone. Are we really about killing birds or killing anything? Um, I know what the purpose is of that expression. Yes, you want to be able to do many things with one action, but we don't need to use the killing birds. So my, um, my preference on that one is Sowing two, planting two trees with one seed. You cannot kill two birds with one stone and you cannot plant two trees with one seed, but the point is made. Or the other one that I hear so much in native English speakers is, oh, well, this is going south. When what is intended is that there is a negative outcome. Well, so does that mean that People who live in the South, either in the South of a country or in the South of the equator, as I do, uh, do you really want to put a negative connotation on that? Or even something as simple as, yeah, 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 sure, I'll send you some bullet points. Bullet points? Really? Is that what we want to contribute to a process where we're actually sending ideas and, and collaborating by sending some, some thought value to a something? I don't think it's bullet points. I also don't think that something that is quite positively impacted should be called a silver bullet. Why a bullet? Why is it not a silver lining? Uh, or another example is black future. Well, that idea has a black future when it is when you mean a negative connotation. Again, the use of black, the use of South to uh, to communicate negative feelings. So just a couple of examples uh, that make us a little bit more aware and mindful about the use of language, because it's inadvertent for sure, but it communicates. It communicates our blind biases, but more importantly, it communicates a feeling under the words that affects our thinking and most definitely affects the impact that we're having on whatever the challenge is that we are um, operating in or with in the outside world. So, so that well, is just yeah. sort of mental. Let me ask you a yeah. Do you, do you think this uh, in, incredible transformation of language that you initiated in Paris, do you think that that um, uh, had a, uh, uh, the positive outcome or, or affected the positive outcome for uh, that meeting? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that that's the only factor for sure. Um, but uh, I think because I explained quite uh, quite deliberately why we wanted to change the language and why we wanted to move the entire mindset from confrontation to collaboration, which was the whole point, and people got it. They're going like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fighting climate change is not very collaborative, is it? Um, and, and so it contributes, right? It is one factor. It is not the only one. But it is one that is easily under our control. And that's why we start with that today, because 
what we speak has incredible impact and it is very powerful and it is a hundred percent under our control. So, um, so just one easy way to begin to transform ourselves into more mindful uh, actors out there in social engagement and one that invites others also to begin to be more mindful about the way that we uh, express ourselves in in front of challenges. You know, and I also want to mention uh, the medical situation because uh, during the pandemic, which in a way we're still in, um, we talked about the front lines and the front lines of climate change and the front lines in uh, delivering health care. And um, the mindset, Dogen said, you know, words can change the destiny of a nation. Words can change the destiny of a nation. And at the level you're talking, Christiana, it is at the pre-conscious level. We aren't, aren't conscious of how these expressions, these terms um, are actually affecting our views. So um, we want to take uh, a moment to ask you, you know, to briefly, very briefly describe a situation where language or metaphors um, uh, were used that were fundamentally toxic or the framing of uh, a situation that you were confronted with tended towards uh, futility. Like for example, how our climate issues are characterized. And then, you know, apropos of that, how, how might you transform the language or use metaphors that are generative, not divisive, and, and that don't breed futility? So um, we just going to essence, we invite you to raise your hand if, uh, uh, with the icon, if you will, or put into the chat, but we wanna have some, uh, some of you, um, uh, yeah, Marina, perfect. Hey, <laughs> Marina, it's great to see you. And you're in our government. You're an AID. So, uh... yes, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. And I am also a big fan of outrage and optimism. The thank podcast. you. <laughs> I listen to it uh, every episode. Um, and hope is a verb where we roll up our shirt sleeves. Um, so one example that I'm that I uh, am I'm working with right now at USAID, which is the U.S. Agency for International Development, been working there um, over the years and working in this movement to end or to end or counter human trafficking um, and to promote decent work. Um, but one of the the long-standing struggles that I have, and I do the same thing in talking points and speeches, is I, I do a look a word search because the, the war metaphors also really trouble me in terms of we need to combat human trafficking. Um, and I always, what, what I like to do is change that word choice to counter. And so now at USAID, we don't have a combating human trafficking policy, code of conduct and, and programming. We have countering human trafficking policies, a code of conduct and, and related programming. Um, so that's just my, my input. I'm really uh, pleased to be here today. Thank you so much. Great to see you, Marina. Thank you so much. A beautiful example. Stacy. Yes. Uh, good morning from Northern Wisconsin. Thank you so much for this session. I wanted to share um, that I, I use the term um, with, with a group of uh, people who identified as non-binary um, in terms of gender expression or gender fluid or, or um, you know, they were uh, transgender individuals. Um, and I, I, used, I used the term that I, I saw the movement that they were building was on the frontier of liberation and that they were pioneers in the movement towards um, towards a fuller liberation. And um, as you can probably guess, the terms frontier and pioneers are, are its own kind of mythology and um, were very offensive to this group in particular, knowing that that was also a term um, that displaced uh, 
you know, indigenous peoples that contributed to the genocide of, of whole cultures and, and um, religions and, and languages. And so um, they, they, they lovingly reminded me of that kind of language and how that is often used to talk about sort of the leading edge um, of something done in love, in, in care, um, but is actually the words themselves connotate a kind of um, a real negativity. So wanted to share that with you all. Mm. If you're thinking of using language like, oh, that's the pioneer, you know, of, of renewable energy um, to just be aware of, of that great teaching that they shared with me. That's beautiful. Thank you. And it's wonderful that they trusted you enough to uh, help you correct course. Wonderful. Uh, Jerome. Oh, thank you for unmuting me. <clears throat> well, Roshi, uh, in uh, the summer of 1997, you and I were talking under a tree at University of Santa Barbara with Thich Nhat Hanh's retreat about fighting cancer. And I have reframed that as healing cancer with your mind. Beautiful. I, I'm still surviving. So it's no longer a fight. It's just a live with kind of thing. So I really Beautiful. appreciate you appreciate this. Thank you very much. It's good to see you again. And, you know, Frank um, has just put in, Frank Ostaseski, nurses as, quote, healthcare heroes. Again, you know, that's the same uh, ethos of war and uh, so forth. Really, really appreciate it. There are quite a few. I've seen them flash by quickly. But anyway, I'm, I'm happy to see you thriving. Thank you. Charmaine. Hello, good evening, everybody here from uh, Europe in Amsterdam. Thank you very much, Roshi and uh, Christiana. Christiana, when you speak about language, that is something I don't have the answer yet, but I'm still uh, contemplating and searching for the word for myself. But when I, uh, my question is here really, when we speak of climate change, this word that goes around climate change in Europe, um, it's great that you had that conversation in Paris, but we still hear so much. It says we must beat and we must fight uh, climate change. That to me, just in my body, that already brings an extreme rub. Because for me, when I hear climate change, I'm asking myself or I look at it and I say, well, climate is a natural evolution. Why don't we change the word climate change? Because the minute we say climate change, we are finding more and more people. It has, a, it has an adverse effect. Then rather than we trying to get together to, to, to create a, a more cleaner environment. And when I look at it out of a political point of view, I'm seeing there's a power struggle in the kind of energy resources that we want to pick and choose in this world. And we seemingly left and right, doesn't matter which po uh, uh, political foot or wing you have, we're not finding the, let's say, the collaboration coming together because we're so busy saying climate change. But on the one hand, the sun and the moon and the wind and the air and the snow, and that's kind of like the way I feel it is a natural evolution. The other aspect is of the housekeeping. How do we housekeep our planet? And this is where it comes into, okay, which resource are we going to choose? And the resources that we choose might not be the same res resources that is valid for each area and each uh, environment on this planet. So on the one side, we might say in the Middle East to, to extract oil is maybe good for that area but it's not good for another area in, in another part of the world. So I, I don't have the answer, but I'm looking to say the more we say climate change, I get the feeling that the more we polarize by saying climate change, where we might be saying we're looking for a common uh, energy transformation or something, mm. because 
anyway, I, I, I haven't you know, found I, a I, word, but this is something I feel here in Europe. We're splitting more and more apart from each other when we use the word climate change because it's got so much different. I, I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but it's uh, that everybody, I feel that not, everybody agrees that we want to have a, a better environment for ourselves and for our future. But when, yeah, when we say climate change, it's it's having an adverse effect. So I don't know what your, uh, because you speak at that other different level in, 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 in your environment where you work in and at the Climate Paris Accords where you people come together. But still in Europe, they're still talking a lot about we must fight it, we must beat it. And we keep on using that we shall change and reshape the world according to us. And then it feels like not everybody's inclusive in there. So it's creating a greater polarization. Thank you. Thank you, Charmaine, so much. I, I, I really appreciate you thinking, you know, so dynamically about this very issue. So we have uh, uh, time for one or two more uh, voices, um, very succinct, going to essence. Um, uh, uh, let's see, Mary. Hold on. <laughs> okay, you're unmuted, Mary. Thank you so much, and I will be succinct. So far from our time together this morning, I have felt so moved by just the notion, the absolute obvious notion, that language reveals store consciousness. Yeah. And one of the phrases, and I'm so glad to share this with everyone, one of the phrases that really gets me, I don't know if you can see, I'm sitting here with my faithful friend, Juno, is uh, dog eat dog to describe human behavior oh. or, or the way things work. And I want to share that there is a beautiful exhibit by an artist named Willie Cole, an African-American amazing artist who took basically a lot of junk and made it into beautiful art. And I took his book home after seeing his work about 15 years ago. And here's what he has to say about Dog Eat Dog, which Dog Eat Dog was one of the titles of his pieces. The powerful phrase Dog Eat Dog asserts a message of endless aggression and consumption that ironically is said to derive from the maxim of Roman writer Marcus Tarant Tarantius Varro in uh, one, 116 to 27 BC, Canis Carinum Non Est, or the real translation, dog does not eat dog. Exactly. Meaning that the behavior would kill its own kind. By the 16th century, when related to human behavior, the phrase had become dog eat dog. As human competition and ruthlessness, ruthlessness prevailed, and the proverb now referring to an unbridled human aggression and brutality moved during the Industrial Revolution into common parlance. So I just want to, again, say how powerful a message this is to say our language shapes our minds. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, uh, Christiana, there are more hands, but I, I think we need to, uh, we need to move on um, with our, our next example. Is, and please, Stuart and Didi and others, uh, hang in there, okay? Christiana. I'm yeah, gonna... but but thank you so much for all of the comments that I've been reading here as 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 it goes uh, scrolls up very quickly. So many of you um contributing more and more examples and I would very much like to thank the person who corrected me on blind biases. Thank you very much for catching me exactly where I don't want to be. Um, so thank you very much. That is not an expression that I shall continue using. Thank you for that. This is That's the power of constant learning, right? And learning from each other. So thank you very much for that. Um, one, more, one more point that I think is really critical and exactly uh, the feedback that you got, how important it is to work 
in a group or in a community where transparent communication is valued. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, where yeah. Um, one does not, uh, quotes, personalize, feel down when uh, one receives feedback, like you just received it so graciously, um, but that someone was giving attention. I Actually, I try not to use the term paying attention. It sounds like an economy of attention, uh, whereas it's a giving of attention, where one uh, is giving attention to you and you're grateful to receive that attention and to receive their perspective. Yes. Um, so, you know, in this learning process, uh, just as you did in Paris, Christiana, um, the interaction that you had, um, not only with your staff, but also with uh, the heads of nations around how views are reflected in the language that we use. And we have to be very conscientious in digging out those unconscious biases that are reflected in our language. Yes. Very exactly. That's the point. So thank you very much for all of the um, other examples. Um, and and then sadly, we have to move on because I actually I would love to collect all of these terms and metaphors that we uh, unmindfully use. Um, I hope someone is going to collect them all and send, send us a beautiful list of things that we would like to try to avoid. Um, but we have to move on to our second um the the second exploration that we wanted to invite you to and we hope uh to have as rich an exchange as we had for the first and that is how how do we reach out to others uh when we already know even before we reach out that i am not going to agree with that person um, and so we get to the conversation already with this um, preconceived notion, which immediately closes the door of the heart um, and certainly of any progress of the conversation. And the, um, the example that I wanted to share with you on this is if, if you think about, um, about emissions of uh, greenhouse gases, which is what causes uh, the uh, the climate to be warming, then you will understand that all countries of the world stand in a very, very different position to each other. So you have those, for example, the small island states, 41 small island states that are incredibly vulnerable because they're only yay high over the ocean um, and sea level rise is threatening their very existence. And they have contributed absolutely nothing to the problem because they are absolutely minor, 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 minute, tiny emitters. So they have not contributed to the problem. And on the other extreme, you have many people in between, but on the other extreme, you have the petro exporting uh, stage such as Saudi Arabia and all of the other Gulf states that have been um, drilling for oil and gas and using that for their own electricity and for export and have been making pretty good national income um, on that export. And so you can imagine that the group of countries A that I explained, they're of course wanting for the use of these um, fossil fuels to be curtailed ASAP in their own protection for their own survival. And you have petrol states uh, such as those around the Gulf states that would like to extend the use of fossil fuels for their own survival because that is their only income. And so you have very, very, um, very different positions. And so in conversation with all countries of the world on, so how do we come together on this? Obviously the countries that are exporters of these fossil fuels are for me, continue to be the more difficult conversations because I need to be open to understand where they're coming from, where their history is and what their dependence is on fossil fuels. So I did, uh, I did go to Saudi Arabia more than to any other country while we were doing this negotiation because I knew that they were a very important country in this negotiation. I knew that they had to be on board because if they are not on board, we would have quite a few petrol states that um, that would not be on board and we needed everyone to be on board. So many, um, many trips there, not to 
talk at them or talk to them, but rather to ask questions to ask questions about their history, where did they come from, uh, to understand the poverty that they were in, interestingly enough, before they discovered that resource, how did they develop it, but also questions about their future. So now that we know that the average temperature is warming and they already live in one of the warmest or hottest areas of the world, how do they see that in the future? If this is going to continue to warm, uh, how are they going to survive on those deserts where they live? So just asking questions, you know, how how do they how do they see that 10, 20, 30 years down, um, down the pike? And with with very interesting conversations coming up where they, of course, are very aware of their history and their responsibility, but also historical responsibility, but also very aware of the government's responsibility to maintain countries and habitats that are inhabitable for humans in addition to other um, living beings. And, um, and the fact that those lands are could be, if we don't uh, do our job, could become uninhabitable is not a good thing for them either. So, and so from that realization, then them coming to say, okay, what we need to do is to, to have economic diversification so that we're not dependent on one product that we all live from. And hence, um, there, since, since then, their uh, very, very sincere and honest efforts and a lot of money actually being put into how are they going to diversify their economy so that they can have other income um, that is not dependent on the fuels that are polluting the entire world? So um, interesting for me, a huge lesson on, well, that took us to a very different outcome rather than something that if I had gone in with my judgment about the contribution of these countries, we probably wouldn't have been able to agree on anything. Um, and also me approaching this from a from a very honest questioning point of view, because I don't know, you know, so not knowing in these in these circumstances is very helpful and being completely transparent about the fact, I don't know. Can you help me think about this? Can we think about this together? Being very, very honest about that and then inviting out of an expansion um, of, of thought, not, not just, you know, though there's one way or there's another way, but really expanding the, uh, the possibilities here. What else can be done that takes us away from binary thinking and binary acting but rather he begins to explore a middle way that they come up with, not, not I. Um, so very interesting lesson for me, lesson learned, that, um, that approaching something like that from deep listening and from questioning, from not knowing, from being witness to what they are, uh, what they're coming up with, can actually take us much farther than um, a confrontational or a judgmental conversation. Um, that would have been way too easy to engage in, but not very helpful or fruitful. So an interesting example um, of that. Um, and I'm sure Roshi wants to put that into bigger context. Well, <clears throat> maybe not bigger, but I, I want to hark back to um, uh, Glassman Roshi's teachings on the three tenets. Um, it's really the, the foundation of socially engaged Buddhism. And uh, even if you're not a Buddhist, um, the tenets are a way for us to uh, approach situations um, with uh, a, a quality of curiosity. And since my friend Frank Ostaseski is on uh, on with us today, you know, Frank and I both emphasize the importance of curiosity, of beginner's mind, of not knowing, of uh, being uh, able to be surprised. Um, of also being aware of uh, the uh, view that 
you might have of what the right outcome should be and how that is stultifying or that strangles possibilities. And um, this kind of uh, openness, you know, is very challenging, particularly for Western educated individuals who prize knowledge, prize facts, and um, who often are not comfortable taking the position that you took, Christiana, uh, one that is characterized by actually a lot of humility, and particularly where, the, you know, the gender situation is kind of as it is in the cultures that uh, you were working in uh, around these issues. So this, this first tenet of not knowing is uh, really uh, essential. And then the second tenet of, of bearing witness, and this is not being a bystander. Um, this is our capacity to actually be in an empathic or resonant or connected relationship with the truth of whatever you are witnessing, the dying cancer patient, uh, a planet under siege, excuse me, there I went into the war. <laughs> it's, so <laughs> it's so easy to do. It's um, so easy to do. And or uh, a culture where, for example, um, uh, we recently, uh, not recently, since uh, 2015, We've been uh, feeding Rohingya refugees in uh, Kathmandu who have no access to social services, to even employment, who are really in a desperate situation. And yet uh, someone who looked at the video seeing these uh, uh, Rohingya women in black burqas um, were just horrified. And yet, you know, this, this experience of, you know, we there is this uh, common humanity and how do we rehumanize our views so that we're able to actually see across the differences and see that's a human being or that's a society um, who are, you know, like all societies to greater and lesser degrees uh, struggling for uh, survival or seeking survival. And so this bearing witness is really important. It's not only uh, to the suffering of the world, but also uh, and being in a resonant relationship with it, but also to the joys of this world. And I think it's remarkable um, uh, what you did in Saudi Arabia, which is to, you know, by bearing witness, it allows um, those who are being born witness to, to actually begin to bear witness to their own uh, situation, their own deliberations, the choices they've made, and the possibilities of transformation. And Bernie always said, you know, he always said, uh, in terms of our ideas of how things should be, it's just your opinion, man, <laughs> out of the big Lebowski. Um, yeah, there are opinions that are sometimes really useful, and but it's also how do we bring out the best in others? And so not knowing and bearing witness is this foundation that allows us to uh, engage in the third tenet of healing action or compassionate action. So I'm going to ask us to take a breath and to listen deeply to yourself in relation to whatever is arising for you in this present moment. I'm going to ask you to uh, bring to mind a, a situation uh, in your life um, where there is confrontation or where there is dissonance right now. And how you might approach this situation from a fresh perspective. really grounding in not knowing and bearing witness. See if you can bring these two pieces forward as you bring to mind 
a situation where there's confrontation or where differences are not aligning. And notice what your experience is in your body. And how the heart feels, gripped or open. And on the in-breath, can you allow yourself to connect to the reality of the other person or the, this situation that is dissonant for you? And check your thinking right now. not uh, with judgment. And imagine what might be the impact, if any, on this situation or on this person if you were able to be present, listen deeply, come from not knowing, and to bear witness, what might be the impact, the outcome, if any. So Christian and I would like to uh, invite you uh, again with raised hands. We'll begin with Stuart if uh, he still wants to. Yes, okay, good. Um, what might be the impact or what was the edge of learning? Stuart. Thank you, Roshi Joan. Thank you, Christiana. So I'm... Um... I'm here from London in the UK, so I'm I'm offering I'm offering two perspectives. I'm offering um, the perspective of a European, and I'm also offering the perspective of a member of the African diaspora. So the first thing I have to say is from a professional perspective, and the second thing I have to say is from a personal perspective. So in my professional perspective, um, one of my dimensions of occupation is as a therapist, as a, a systemic constellations practitioner. So I'm very explicit with the client groups that I work with that personally, I'm a Zen Buddhist practitioner, but that it's not necessary for the clients to be of the same faith or of any faith, but I just want to be very transparent with them about how I understand our experience in the world. In terms of the work itself, it's impossible for me to have a fixed view of what the most appropriate solution will be for any given client in terms of the issue they bring to me because until I meet them for the first time, and in most cases, we're only going to meet for an hour or 90 minutes, and then we might never meet again for the rest of our lives. Equally, we might meet again in a month's time, but in the first instant, I'm assuming this will be our only encounter together. So in the time that we have, my first role is to convey to them without any ambiguity that they are held in a space of acceptance where there's no blame and there's no shame in whatever narrative they share with me and with the witnessing circle 
that enables us to be resourced to undertake the work we're going to do together. And the second thing I make explicit to them is that I am in service to their need. So, of course, there's a great deal more I could say about the work, but I want to just try to be very concise and very simple. So the second piece in terms of my identity in the world as a member of the African diaspora is that every day I leave my front door, my life is at risk. Yeah. My life imperiled by a semi-militarized police force. Now, I'm fortunate in that in the UK, the extent of that risk and the extent of that militarization is not as great as, as it is in the USA. But tragically, it's still a common occurrence that black folk here are regularly murdered by the state through the mechanism of the police. So when one lives under that condition, one has to be very attuned to the nature of impermanence. One has to be very attuned to the fact that any encounter with the police could be fatal. So that isn't to say that one walks around with the mindset of a victim, but that actually one has the opportunity to be a human ambassador by the way in which one open-heartedly and uncalculatedly engages with those representatives of the state. That is a very keen-edged form of practice. And in this context, that practice is unrel unrelenting. Mm -hmm. And one has to have an unerring heart to hold and manage that dynamic. Mm. So those are two perspectives I offer. Mm. Stuart, thank you so much. I, I really, uh, I want to acknowledge, first of all, the set, the set that you bring to uh, those whom you serve uh, as, as a listener, as a reflector, and also uh, the sense of um, vulnerability and dignity that um, you have uh, manifested in speaking to the truth that um, people of color in Britain, but also in, in particularly in our country, um, are living another reality than the privileged. So uh, we, thank you. I'd like us to take a breath and uh, take in Stuart's words. I see my student Monica Son, also a person of color, deep bows to Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. Dee Dee. Uh, with all my heart, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. With all my heart, I want to be brief. It's so difficult. Anyway, I went to my favorite breakfast place this morning. And um, on my way out to pay, there was a lovely young couple. A man had his baby on the front of him. I just happened to say, I'm not a baby person, I would say. I don't know. I mean, I had two kids, but I'm not really a baby person. I'm not a drawn to babies. But I said hello to this little baby, almost like, oh, I kind of have to, right? And uh, oh, my God, one look at that baby. Oh, my God. I could say it's changed the world in a way for me because um, I saw how perfect human beings are. 
And I've mm -hmm. grown up as such an environmentalist. And, you know, to me, a squirrel is as good or better than a human being. And I've seen so much degradation in my life since the 50s, living on the beach in the Florida Keys. And uh, I realize I have actually never seen the beauty in a human being. And I actually saw that this morning. And, you know, I'm very new to Bernie. And um uh, uh, so I, I try to take him in as much as I can. And I must say, it's like a little goes a long way. And he said something about, somebody was asking him about, oh, it's so overwhelming. You know, what can we do? And he sort of said, like, if the baby's crying, just pick it up. And my son is 37 and an addict and has died many times and is in a, a facility now. And, you know, I want to help him with all my heart and all my might. So when Bernie said that, I thought, okay, that's the go ahead. I'm just going to help my son. I'm going to forget about helping the squirrels, you know, just help my son. So I don't know. It was just very profound to me to see, you know, it's, you can hear these concepts, truth, love, and beauty. But mm. Goethe really nailed it. But wow, that's all. I mean, he put his little fingers. It was, a, I think it was a little boy. You know, I put out my hand. He put his little fingers right on the top of my my fingers. And, you know, I've been against concepts for a long time. I mean, fuck concepts, right? They get you in a whole lot of problem and a whole lot of shit. But this was, I think, the most moving experience I've had. I mean, it's just sinking in now. I mean, it could, because it's, you could say it's such a prejudice I've had until I was probably about that age of just how horrible human beings are. Thank you, I Judy. love nature. I've always loved nature. <laughs> I've always felt I was a tree and a this and a that and a this and a that. But this particular, whatever we are, it's pretty great. It's actually pretty great. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I love Joanna Macy, of course, with all my heart. And the, But I kind of wondered, Okay, she's a Buddhist, she's come around. That's another thing, the equanimity part. That okay, this like life, human life here, it was a it was a really interesting experiment, but you know, it it's obviously not working. And it may end. So I thought I'm okay with that. It's equanimity, but now I have new hope. Thank you, Didi, so much. You know, and in, in Zen we call this the taste that turns us around. <laughs> and that it happened at the checkout counter with this little baby. <laughs> and suddenly you recognized, you know, what His Holiness, the Dalai Lama keeps saying, you know, our common humanity. Mm -hmm. And how, how beautiful you made that connection now turning towards your son. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. I'm going to, um, uh, I just want to check in with Christiana. My beloved sister. Christiana, are you there? Thank you. Somebody helped me unmute. I couldn't find the unmute button. I'm totally here. Oh, good. So I, I want us to just to take a breath. Um, you know, hearing uh Stuart's uh very deep perspective about rehumanization and Didi also bringing that sensibility into her recent experience. And the power of sitting with uh, not knowing, of being open. The person you were before you met that baby is not exactly the same person that met that baby. So, Rhett, I'm um, inviting you to go to Essence. You're unmuted, Rhett. Thank you. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. My name is Rhett. Um, I'm a physician. I do a couple of things, but one of them is I'm a hospitalist. So I work in the hospital with sick adults um, and classically, at the bedside, um, information flow has been kind of unidirectional, unidirectional, but I don't think that's 
I personally don't think that's very healthy for anyone, for the patient, for the person mm -hmm. in the bed or me or the rest of the team. And so I try and immediately get to the question, what do you think is going on and uh, what do you want and what does a good outcome look like for you in this situation? Because mm -hmm. often the answer to that is pretty surprising to me and can help us together tailor that. And a lot of the work I do can be peri hospice in the sense that sometimes what we're evaluating is, is this a time that you want to change direction and how you're looking at your healthcare? Or do you even want to have that conversation? Is that a conversation that we should think about later? And trying to explore what that person's wants, needs, fears, what their loves are, who they need to be around, who they need to consult with. That's mm -hmm. an incredibly important part of the medicine, so much more so than the technology or the pharmaceuticals. And um, I feel like that's relevant to our larger discussion about climate because to understand each other, especially say petroleum exporting countries, we have to understand what they fear and what they want and what a good outcome looks like to them so that we can work together. Thank you so much, Rhett. And I notice um, your uh, roots in this land, you Shoshone Dine. and how you brought this sense of respect of listening inquiry forward in how you were sharing what you do as a physician. Thank you. Laura. Thank you, Roshi. My name's Laura. Um, I am weeks into a new role in a public international charter school where it's pre-K through eighth and 80% are multilingual students. Um, all are low income. Most are refugees or first generation from Karen and Kareni states in Myanmar. And my role is to work with a seven-year-old little boy who no one really knows what's going on because he is so young and there's a language barrier. And, you know, I was told he didn't speak. I was told he was very aggressive and the goals were just to build trust, um, which I've been doing. I'm trained in socially, or excuse me, um, social emotional learning. And other than that, I have no qualifications for this role. <laughs> But I, this last week was particularly challenging. He, he has immense sensory overload that can occur. And being in a classroom with 20 other six and seven year olds can be too much and he can't always vocalize that it's happening. So I'm trying to learn what will cause an upset. And this week we had two upsets where chairs were thrown and it was, you know, grabbing his body, holding him so close carrying him around like you know a toddler for most of the rest of the day and i was i've been struck by the teachings in this program and just continually meeting the school is amazing we do not discipline it is met with what will calm his body down it is met with um you know, real appropriate recognizing that he does not have control over this at this mm -hmm. time. And he is reacting in the only way he knows how. And, um, and when, I, what are you, what are you learning? Well, I was sitting with him Friday and just, we were able to have a conversation but of asking the questions, like we've learned so much in this. And as Christiana was just saying of the reframing of the language and just sitting with 
how I can ask these questions more appropriately as I'm sitting in this group today. Um, so that then he can learn to vocalize and also learning with him ways that he can give direction to avoid these upsets. Mm -hmm. And I just wanna thank you all today, both in the chat and in the sharings of how we're all leading compassion first. Thank you, Laura, so much. You know, uh, we we just finished Rohatsu's session here at Upaya, and Kaz Tanahashi uh, made a very important point. Sometimes um, the scale of our endeavors is enormous, like the work that Christiana uh, was engaged in. And sometimes it's very intimate. And it's not to put greater value on the scale on the size of what we do. Reaching across um, this, the differences to make an authentic connection uh, is so important at this time. And we learn, uh, just as Didi and the baby, <laughs> you and your young Rohingya man, uh, young man, um, it's where uh, in these deep, personal, authentic connections um, where a certain kind of realization that is uh, essential unfolds. So I just thank you so much for what you're doing. Toby, nice to see you. Welcome. Um, hi. I'm um, good to see you, Joan, and um, thank you. Um, I really enjoyed that exercise that you just brought us on, and it made me think of my situation at work. I'm a nurse, and for almost three decades, I've been a NICU nurse. So I work a lot with um, premature babies and other babies that need some kind of support. And, and just this past week, I had two experiences that I was interested in sharing. One is um, as far as listening and deep listening, my patients don't verbally speak back, but they do communicate if, if I am willing to tune into them and listen. So I had one patient who had been with us for about a few weeks who had a lot of difficulty eating and um, his heart rate would drop with feeding and he would show other signs of stress. And I had him in the beginning once he was born and then I didn't have him again until last week. And I was able to listen and watch his cues and realize, well, I, I, you know, I just kind of had a thought of something that we could try. And I spoke to the physician about it and we tried it and it actually worked. And then I taught his parents and now he is going home, which is really wonderful. Yeah. So, so it really, took deep listening, but to in a different kind of deep listening, um, you know, to this um, neonate who, you know, uh, communicated in very subtle ways. Um, the, the, the second thing that I wanted to share was I've been working in this one NICU. It's very small and it's very different from any of the much larger and more acute NICUs I had been in. And I work with people who are from all over the world and they have different ways of communicating and different cultural and social norms. And I've realized over the years that painfully that I've insulted unintentionally and I've been slowly trying to repair 
relationships where I've, I've come in with like a lot of experience and want to convince them that, you know, the way that I may want to do something is better than the way that they want to do. And I backed off and have had conversations and really practicing deep listening and hearing about why they do the things that they do and so forth. And um, so now we have a new committee. So we're going to be um, in deciding practices going forward so that there are wow. standards. Oh, that is so fantastic, Toby. Thank and you. Uh, I know Christiana um, affirms this. Um, you taking responsibility for your unskillfulness is part of the equation. And I, I thank you for sharing that uh, process with us. Christiane, I'd love to invite you to um, uh, reflect for a moment on this, the, this piece that we're working on and exploring right now. Yeah, thanks, um, Joan. So thank you very much for to everyone who has shared. Um, and and I'm I am listening actually to many other people who haven't shared yet, as either verbally or on the chat, but are also contributing to the richness of the tapestry that is being woven here. Um, and I was I was just feeling that it's interesting how there are so many different levels of this thing that we call hearing or listening. Hearing, I think, is what we do with our ears is very, you know, physically sensory and and not everyone has that sense, but those who do, um, that's what we do. Then there is a listening that I think is very brain or mind focused. I'm listening to an argument. I'm listening to something that is being presented. Um, and then there is deep listening, which is not done with the ears. It is not done with our mind. It's done with the heart. And the examples that were just shared are really about deep listening, uh, which includes listening to the needs of neonatal uh, children who can't speak yet, or those who are in the process of transitioning out of this earthly life, or any of the other examples, because it is when we listen with our heart open, right? So that is what deep listening is about. It's about opening our heart and really being very, very receptive to what is coming from the other side as opposed to what's coming up from our side. Um, and and it's just, it, it is such a, um, a, a rich and fertile communication, if you will, with other people, because we totally get out of our shoes and are very open to seeing what's occupying the shoes of others, whether they be humans or in fact, even non-humans. We haven't even listened, talked about deep listening to nature, which is also um, part there. So very beautiful examples. Thank you very much uh, to everyone. Thank you, Christina. So, Christine, I want to invite us now to move into uh, the the next topic, which is the power of respect, um, the uh, essentiality of non-polarization, and the work of bridging the divides. Steve, Christian, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, good. Um, shall we start? I'm I'm still with um the examples that were shared. Um, thank you for that. So um we're going to um move over to an, another exploration that we wanted to invite in. I hope you're realizing that all of these explorations are interlinked and are mutually um, supportive of each other. So it's not like they are separate silos, they're all interlinked. 
Um, but the one that we would like to um, invite you to focus on now um, is, is a real biggie for me and I think for most of us, which is this um, tendency that we have to fall into victim perpetrator mentality. Um, consciously or unconsciously, um, perhaps you know mostly unconsciously or or even consciously, but it is it is such an overwhelming dynamic that if we allow ourselves to fall into it, then we're just playing the role, uh, and and we're really good at playing the role. We're especially good at playing the role of victim. I think that's where we are very very good at. Um, and and the example that um, that I wanted, and, and I must say that I grew up with that dynamic being very um, present for me, and in fact even emphasized for me. So it is um, something that um, that I'm still sort of working through. But I wanted to share with you one example of how I realize that it is so powerful to begin to get out of out of that seesaw. The way I think about it is a seesaw victim perpetrator uh, without even considering the rescuer, which is sometimes there, but sometimes not. Um, and, and that is as we were working toward this global uh, agreement, I was having a very difficult personal time uh, in my marriage and I had convinced myself that I was a victim of a very, very painful situation. And I was very much in the mental box of um, being a victim of someone that I then, of course, labeled as the perpetrator, i.e. my former husband, because that's the first thing to rem to remember. The moment that we put ourselves into the victim role, we are automatically accusing someone else of being a perpetrator. Um, and, and so I was dealing with all of that in my personal, uh, personal life. And I began to realize that one of the things that was holding up uh, progress on coming to a global agreement is the victim perpetrator dynamic that is present not just in our own personal lives, but actually at the biggest level, which is at the global level, where industrialized countries are labeled perpetrators against the developing countries who are the victims of the historical emissions of industrialized countries and where the in that dynamic, we say, well, wait a second, industrialized countries have all of the benefits that they do, all the creature comforts, because the industrial revolution uh, was benefiting them, but not benefiting developing countries who are now facing the worst damages and the worst impacts of climate change, and yet they're not responsible for it. So a really, really clear setup of victim perpetrator um, and one that has long, long and deep, deep historical roots in the relationship between the global north and the global south. And so not surprisingly, this was there, it was present, very, very difficult uh, conversations, and it needed to be addressed in order to come to a common path of uh, decarbonizing the global economy. And I, I remember the morning that I woke up and I went, oh, my Buddha. Yes, there is a very, very clear relationship here between my putting myself personally into a victim role and judging others or other as perpetrator and what I see is going on here at the global level. And I realized until I can begin to crawl out as I saw it, crawl out of my victim box, it was gonna be very difficult for me to facilitate a global crawling out of that same dynamic, just at a different level, but it's the same dynamic. So I did, uh, it was it was a real, again, a big lesson learned for me that whatever happens at one level of the system is always happening at other levels of the system, that we cannot divide that, that all of this is interbeing, is interacting, is, is interrelated, and that sometimes 
when it's very difficult to work at one level of the system, whether that's the family, the office, the uh, the, the boss, the, the, the city, whatever level you are um, working at, if that's really, really difficult, then we can always look for the same exact dynamic going on at a different level and see if there's progress there. And so by working through uh, or at least working on, not through, because I'm still working on this. There is certainly a remainder there. Um, but at least alleviating my victim box, I was able then to step into a much more open and compassionate understanding of the same dynamic at the global level and begin to bring uh, countries of the global north and global south together around uh, very key collective and joint concepts that they could agree on once they were over the very, I would say, very primitive uh, victim perpetrator uh, dynamic. And as, as we know from, uh, from the Dharma Triangle, sometimes there is a rescuer and sometimes there is not. And so what, what, how do we begin to get off this seesaw uh, that we have a victim perpetrator in order to be able to facilitate our own growth, nurture our own growth, but also help others to get off of that um, of that seesaw that so many of us are in. Um, and 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 I call it a seesaw because maybe we start as a victim, but very soon, as soon as we accuse the perpetrator of something, that person turns into then the victim, and then that person or that whatever the entity, if it's an institutional entity, then becomes the victor and we become accused of uh, of being the perpetrator. And there we go, right? And that that um that uh, is a never ending. And, and think about it. I mean, in in the history, for example, the history of Israel is such a good historical example of this or the history of the African-American population in the United States. Such a good example of this. And you can go on and on and on and on. So to realize that it's both at a personal level, but also at a systemic level, and that our responsibility here is definitely to start with our personal and thereby enable ourselves to um, help to step out of that at the systemic level. Can't hear you. Thank you, Christiana. I I really uh, I really appreciate you evoking the Cartman's drama triangle of the perpetrator, the victim, and then the rescuer dynamic, where those roles change. I want to reflect for a moment on the work of uh, the neuroscientist and social psychologist Molly Crockett. And um, where uh, she, in her work, she has uh, said that, you know, there's a kind of popular belief that human beings are fundamentally selfish and um, that only a few people are able to really extend compassion. And um, this idea that um, we have uh, Crockett has pointed out has um, actually had a major impact on the social sciences and also on policymaking. And, you know, we've seen this through the pandemic where leaders have repeatedly set policies that are motivated by the worst assumptions about human nature. But Crockett's work and the work of uh, many others in the fields of uh, neuroscience, social psychology, psychology, basically shows that these assumptions are incomplete and misleading. And um, this whole notion of the selfish gene, that selfishness is our natural default. And so this is how we begin to perceive people. People are operating out of self-interest only. And uh, this is um, uh, interesting because from the point of view of neuroscience, we know that serving others actually uh, activates 
uh, the brain re reward system. Um, the, the very same system that responds to basic pleasures like playing with a baby or uh, eating delicious foods or um, uh, encountering a good friend. And that um, harmful behavior, the perpetrator behavior, but as well, the victim behavior um, uh, dampens down uh, the brain reward system. And we've discovered that, you know, um, being generous makes people happy. And um, just as Didi was saying, you know, in, in connecting with this baby, um, these instincts are very uh, present uh, in, in infants. Um, but stories create our shared reality. And the stories Molly has pointed out, Dr. Crockett has pointed out, that we tell ourselves about who we are and who others are in a certain way are self-fulfilling prophecies. And it has been great getting together with uh, Christiana and also my beloved friend, Rebecca Solnit in you know, looking at optimism and hope. Um, and what Christiana and Molly, uh, Rebecca and I all agree is that we're in a kind of story crisis. And that cynical stories about human nature um, uh, actually limit our potential as individuals and as communities to meet the challenges that we're facing today. So I wanted just to put this in, you know, it's like we began this session with um, language Language reflects our views. Those views actually um, are woven into the stories that we tell about ourselves, about each other, about those who are different from us, about the fate of this earth. So I wanted to say, you know, also that um, these negative stories, unfortunately, are really what grab our attention. And this is what, you know, sells news. And uh, this is what makes our social media platforms like Twitter, for example, be kind of uh, hubs of um, incredible uh, and destructive uh, uh, pessimism. And one of the interesting things is that when people express outrage, or when people see others expressing outrage, they become uh, more likely to express it themselves. In other words, it's a kind of contagion uh, that has infected um, our society or our societies. And it's rewarded, of course, uh, in our social media. And more outrage creates more outrage. And we know this does not reflect reality. Um, uh, people tend to overperceive outrage. And they don't just uh, limit our potential for cooperation, according to Molly's work. Um, they can actually motivate uh, the worst atrocities that. Uh, have been uh, part of our history, and some of which are unfolding right now. As is the case with Myanmar, as you know, having heard from our Rohingya brothers and sisters in Kathmandu. So our language and um, the words, the stories that we tell ourselves and tell each other are really critical in transforming um, the and opening uh, the possibilities for uh, allowing, um, as Thich Nhat Hanh has said, for a future to be possible. So I wanted to um, put uh, the, these pieces into uh, our deliberations uh, right now. Um, 
uh, and I'm, I want to invite Christiana to say uh, one more thing about the story uh, in relation to the global north and the divide with the global south. Yeah, well, stories are so important, right? Whether we call them stories or whether we call it narrative or whether we call it self-image, whatever way, it is all basically the, the same. And um, there is, I think, a very dangerous uh, preponderance right now, certainly in the environmental field, but I think also in the social because they're both interrelated. Um, that we as uh, as one species are not capable of turning this around, that we're actually heading down into doom um, as we are accompanied and enrobed by gloom. And, 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 and the question really is, really? Are you absolutely sure about that? Um, is it not really the opportunity to turn the the situation that we find ourselves in to turn it around in sort of a martial arts way and just like we transform personal pain into compassion and into mindfulness um, and and that is our personal path is it not now just take that to the systemic level is it not the moment to turn what we see out there as destruction and what some then uh, conclude into a doomism attitude, is it not our moment to transform that destruction into actually uh, to recognize the resilience of nature and turn it into regeneration? Because that's what we do at a personal level. When we have a breakdown, when we have a huge uh, challenge that we're dealing it uh, with, we are taught in this practice to transform it into, to resource ourselves and transform it into a generative um, attitude and mindset. And just, it is just as true at the global level or anything in between as it is at the personal level. So, you know, contrary to that story that, uh, that some are adhering to that we will never be able to deal with all of these crises. Um, I'm really excited about the fact that, wow, this is this is the moment in which we're being called to transform uh, not just ourselves, but at all systems of the level, we're being called to transform, to delve into our innate resilience um, and to be regenerative with ourselves and with nature and see her uh, thrive at the same time as we can thrive. So I'm actually quite excited. You know, uh, Christiana, at the beginning of uh, the pandemic, uh, Aaron Dati Roy wrote these words and I just pulled them up. Uh, uh, she said, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And we stand uh, really on uh, the threshold of an extraordinary possibility for global transformation. Yeah. And these pessimistic views um, of uh, the natural world and of human nature will actually keep us stuck in vicious cycles of suspicion and division. And one of the important things, and I feel like you manifested this in Paris, is the role of leadership. And leadership, whether it's a doctor or a nurse or a parent or a teacher, um, that uh, taking leadership, taking uh, responsibility can truly help um, uh, systems get unstuck by sharing uh, more accurate views about our capacity uh, to meet a world with resilience. So I, I want to just uh, put those seeds out into this uh, uh, field that we're planting. And I'm going to ask us to take uh, a few moments um, again, to uh, recall uh, a, a time 
um, when you moved out of the perpetrator, the rescuer, or the victim role uh, at the personal level or at the system level? And what assisted you in making that shift? What was it that allowed you to not take things so personally, to stay grounded, to not operate out of your knowing, out of your assumptions? What, what assisted you in maintaining good boundaries and keeping clear agreements. What supported you in being vulnerable, in being accountable, in being responsible, and in being fearless? What made that possible for you? Just take this breath in the body. Um, remember a time when you found yourself in, you know, one of those three positions or moving around in that victim, perpetrator, rescue, or dance. And what allowed you to move out of that? And I'm going to invite uh, you, Frank and Donna, just uh, two words. What was it? What was the main thing? Not the whole story, uh, but just, uh, Frank, what were the, what, what, what was it? And please also in the chat, what were the, what was the thing that, um, the resource that allowed you to move out? Not the whole story, just two words, Frank. You're on, owning, you're on, yeah. Owning your projections. Great, beautiful, Frank, thank you. Donna, you're unmuted. Two words. It's a couple more. No longer a mental patient. Wonderful, thank you, Donna. Lynn. My therapeutic touch uh, studying practice, which is an energy medicine, which is. Great. Thank you. Just two words, Didi. Veritas. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. Veritas. Rich. Um, yeah, what? Uh, oh. Two words. Other people. <laughs> Other people. Other. Great. Beautiful, wonderful, communitas indeed. Teresa. Uh, two words, choice, choice. and um, an open heart. Beautiful, thank you. Kuya, two words. Recognizing, I'm gonna have more than two. Recognizing and integrating radiant love. Beautiful, wonderful. Kim. Deeply understanding the other. Beautiful. Very wonderful. We're going to uh, go to the chat and just reflect some of what you put in the chat. Opening to their perspective. Catherine says being willing. Clarity in loss. Serving the greater good. Marina, I love this, humor and humility. We're all in this together. Carolyn Seca. Karen says, dear friends. See, we're seeing how important relationship is here. Carrie, love. Laura, owning my pain. Jacqueline, just like me. 
Monica, compassion and inner abundance. Yes, do not foster a mind of poverty, which is a victim's perspective, a mind of poverty in yourself or of others. Just like what Molly Crockett says, we have really underestimated our humanity. I invite you to scroll through some of these responses, including Laura saying strength and ambiguity, and take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. So friends, uh, we want to take a 10 minute break. It's uh, 1145. Uh, we'll come back five minutes before the hour. I, I invite you to just stretch uh, and get a glass of water, do what you need to take care of your body. Five minutes before the hour will return. Thank you, Christiana, and thank you, everyone.
So welcome back, everybody. <clears throat> now, if you could, uh, thank you. Thank you. So one of the things that um, people like us, whether we're in the medical profession or a social activist or climate activists, um, one of the things that uh, really is a tangle for many of us is how um, do we work with uh, the situation <clears throat> when um, outcomes uh, don't match our expectations? This is, um, needless to say, not knowing, you know, is the perfect uh, cure. <laughs> Um, but uh, our expectations, our aspirations, um, our hopes, if we're sitting with a person who has cancer, that their cancer will be uh, healed, uh, our hope that the climate situation will shift with a deep engagement, um, uh, our hope that racism uh, in our country will uh, diminish at least somewhat, if not totally, our hope that our politics will not be so corrupt. You know, we had expectations that are operating uh, at the pre-conscious level and also at the conscious level. And um, when those expectations or aspirations, um, when they aren't met, um, how do we work with it? Uh, how do we work with the sense of uh, disappointment? of uh, cynicism, of futility. Um, I think my friend, Cinda Rushton is uh, on with us right now. Is that right, Cinda? If you could raise your digital hand. Are you there, Cinda? There she is, great. <laughs> Cinda, I'm gonna, uh, oh good, you're unmuted. Um, I want to un unmute you for a minute. Um, I, I want to ask you uh, to also uh, define moral. Are you there? Whoops. I'm here. Great. Thanks, Cinda. Um, to define moral remainder, because I think this is something you've written uh, extensively about. When Thank you me. don't get what you want and the outcome is not great. Thank you, Roshi. I'm not in a great space to turn my camera on, but I'm okay. going to speak about this topic. Um, even when we've done our best and we've, all things considered, do what we think is right based on our values, there are often unmet obligations and commitments that we couldn't possibly meet. And it's that sort of moral remainder, that moral residue that stays with us. That sense of, I couldn't do what I really wanted to do or thought I should do. And our challenge, I think, is how to put that in the right perspective. That often the way we respond to that is seeing that we have failed rather than to be able to honor the efforts that we made and to let go of thinking that we can control the outcome. And so I think that place of um, letting go of the expectation that we can fix unfixable problems, that somehow if we work harder, if we are smarter, if we engage more people that we will solve, these problems. So um, I think what that tracks back to for me is how do I stand in a place of integrity in the midst of so much complexity, confusion, and uncertainty? And I think that brings us back to why we're here and who we really are as the grounding to help us stay the course in the midst of these often unsolvable problems.
example, um, where expectations were not met and also uh, the experience of moral remainder and how to work with it. And that is, uh, some of you have heard this story. I worked at the penitentiary of New Mexico on death row and maximum security. And one of the prisoners, Terry Clark, who uh, raped and killed a little girl was uh, to be executed. But um, uh, there was uh, great resistance in the system to uh, carrying out an execution in the state of New Mexico. And it turned out that uh, Terry uh, called off his appeal and in fact uh, was executed. And me and uh, my partner, my partner and I, Laurel Carraher, who brought me into the prison system work, um, were requested by the lawyers to uh, interact with Terry to try to persuade him uh, to reinstate the appeal. And we worked intensively with Terry. And it was uh, very deep, connected work. He never left his cell. Um, he His cell was uh, filled with cigarette smoke. Laurel and I would sit on the concrete floor outside of his cell with the food port open and spend sometimes an hour uh, t talking with him, hearing from him. And in the end, uh, he chose to have himself executed. And I had two uh, very powerful uh, experiences of moral remainder that uh, were very present for me. One is working inside of uh, a very dysfunctional system, the prison, where uh, violence and disrespect, harm is uh, the field that one operates in. And was I uh, actually creating the conditions where uh, people, men in this case, could uh, adapt to a highly toxic, uh, highly traumatic system? So that was one. And two was the feeling that I didn't do enough for Terry. And um, that Laurel and I, in spite of many hours of interacting with him, uh, this uh, outcome was the absolute worst nightmare from my point of view. And what I learned in doing this work, um, one is, you know, of course, the three tenets were very uh, present for me, not knowing. But I did experience a profound disappointment when uh, he chose to have his life ended. And I felt, in a way, uh, responsible. Uh, for not uh, being skillful enough in persuading him otherwise. And I will say, you know, it's decades. This was in the 90s since uh, uh, this interaction, series of interactions with Terry Clark happened. And it stays with me. It's a story I think many of you have heard me tell before. Uh, the moral remainder is part of the, the process for those of us who are trying to work in a transformational way in systems that are messy and complex, often unjust, and um, the best thing might not happen. And I know Christiana has had this same experience. But the good part for me of moral remainder is that um, it works you. It um, actually... Uh, becomes a way for a sort of humility to arise, knowing that um, maybe the best outcome was that he was put to death. I mean, I don't know. From my point of view, it wasn't. But, but that I live with this kind of humility of not knowing, of making, uh, you know, as I said in Rohatsu Seshin, it's continuous failure, learning from uh, mistakes. And um, always uh, with the sense of this kind of uh, openness to uh, failure and pulses of futility, but knowing that uh, I have to stay the course that is, uh, uh, has been uh, my life of living by vow. 
even though those vows are broken uh, all the time. Uh, I'm just a human being, but I stay the course. I continually show up and I continually learn. Um, Cind has just put a note in the uh, chat. Um, she says, moral residue or remainder is part of our work on moral resilience. She's written an extraordinary book on moral resilience that incorporates a lot of, uh, of uh, the work that Sin and I have done for many years. Um, so I, I want to just say uh, how important this is. And I want to uh, invite us just briefly to explore a situation um, that you faced or that you're facing now where you have a clear sense of what you want to happen because you feel it serves the greater good. But you also know uh, it might not turn out that way or um, it hasn't turned out that way, even though you've put a ton of energy into it. And again, I want you just to answer this question for yourself. How um, might you manage a failure in this situation? And just, you know, reflect that question. And since many of us work in community or in teams, how might you create perspective in your team so that a non-positive outcome doesn't demoralize the team? So those were two questions, and I'm going to ask again for two-word answers. Um, either in the chat um, or uh, raise your hand. Mary, you've spoken, so I'm gonna ask uh, Roberta to, um, uh, Roberta, yes. How do you work that edge for yourself and, and for those you're working with? Mm. You're, you're unmuted, Roberta. Um. The vulnerability of not knowing. Yeah. Wonderful. Christine, two words. You, oh, okay. Thank you. Um, Self-compassion. Going on Wonderful. with self-compassion. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. Lynn. You're unmuted. Healthy remorse. Healthy remorse, great, as opposed to unhealthy remorse. Wonderful, very helpful. Uh, Carol. Showing up. Showing up, exactly, you show up. Heather says honor, uh, bearing witness to what is, transparency, letting go of ego, well, yeah. Karen Skanky. Remembering the soft front. Yeah, Joyce, Grace, and the awareness of our intention. Wonderful. So these will all be, sometimes I feel the reality here is so different. Alcio, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And um, what do you mean? The reality in Brazil is so different. Of course, it's different. But uh, share, what, share what you mean, Alcio from Brazil. Hold on, Alcio. Yeah, you're unmuted, Alcio. Yes, thank you, Roshi. So nice to see you. You are always beautiful. Oh, oh. I'm a uh, Brazilian, so I have to be somewhat seductive in the beginning. But uh, anyway, what I see is different. It's because Reality is so violent on the South. I mean, people can really get killed every day. I mean, it's not, as Stuart said, uh, police can be very violent, but in Brazil, it's not really only violent. It's really murdering people. 
And so uh, sometimes, although I'm a, a person of indigenous extraction, I'm protected a bit by my doctor situation. But the truth is people who are not protected by their social status are really at risk. And so they get killed, really killed. And so sometimes we feel really, I, I would say, I mean, sometimes you feel responsible in the sense that you cannot stimulate people too much to react because they can be killed. And uh, sometimes I feel even a little bit uh, ashamed of working because some people get killed. And I, I don't know if I'm really being clear about it, but I thank you very much for this kind of activity because I think it's important for us to feel like a, a global community and uh, and there and so we, we can feel like uh, like I feel like I'm more alive when I'm here with you, so I can work with my people. And it's so good to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alciola. So good to see you. So, Christiana, I want to. Um, invite you to reflect as someone who is a climate diplomat, so to speak, uh, and who, you know, is from the global south and who has worked at the highest level and also, um, you know, knowing what your father did uh, in Costa Rica to end the military and to uh, create a kind of uh, ecological refuge of Costa Rica. But I would love to hear from you, Christiana, um, your perspective on this uh, issue of uh, uh, not having our expectations met. Well, dear friends, so Roshi is asking me this question with a very clear intent here. <laughs> <laughs> because Roshi Joan and I have been having this conversation for quite a while. Um, and uh, so I would just like to be very honest and say, because I have dedicated my life to, uh, to addressing climate change, I felt very, very attached to a good outcome. And I felt anything that does not guarantee social justice, that does not guarantee protection of the most vulnerable, that does not guarantee that those who come after us will have uh, a dignified life with, uh, with integrity and with livelihood. Anything that did not guarantee that was insufficient. And I have been actually pretty adamant about that for many years. Until I met Roshi Joan. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so in my conversations with um, with Roshi, I have come to understand uh, one of the basic insights of Buddhist practice, which is the fact that we have both a historical reality as well as an ultimate reality or ultimate dimension. And the historical dimension in which we're all living right now, in which we, you know, we identify as the year this or year 2020 or 2030 or 2050 or, you know, whatever. Um, it is it is our life as we see it and as we live it right now. Obviously, and on that dimension, we're all called to do our utmost on whatever it is that uh, that we have chosen to be passionate about and whatever the challenge is and and each of us is operating in in in, in different spaces all of which are interrelated so there at that level um i do still feel that the challenges that we face are large enough to warrant that we all do our utmost and in the ultimate dimension we are not able to guarantee success on any of our social issues, on any of our environmental issues. And in the ultimate dimension, we know that there are forces that are 
way beyond us, uh, certainly way beyond our planetary existence, our lifetime, uh, and in fact, that even go beyond beyond the generations that we usually think of. I usually think of seven generations after me. Well, what about 70 or 700 generations? That is something that is very difficult to wrap our heads around. And yet that is also a very important reality. And so to me, what has brought me some sense of peace is to know that I live in the historical dimension and I do my utmost, but I also touch and every day touch more deeply the ultimate dimension. And that gives me a sense of peace of knowing that I am doing my utmost and I do not have full control over the future uh, in the long term or in the higher understanding of, uh, of time to come. So I I moved away from what I was thinking of as a binary choice between doing this or doing that, doing enough or not doing enough, and actually knowing that I can do my utmost and at the same time not contradicting that. Um, it could be that we don't have the outcome that we wish. And I'm at peace with that. Um, because I believe that both of those are not only um, existing at the same time, but they're actually mutually uh, supporting each other, both of those dimensions. So that's the way that I have come to peace with this um, under the wonderful teaching of Roshi Joan. Oh, thank you, Christina. So I want to just share a little thing with you. You know, I recently was in Dharamsala moderating a science meeting on behalf of His Holiness and the Mind and Life Institute. And again and again, you know, His Holiness emphasized that we are one community, human and all species. And he kept coming back to how important warm heartedness is. You know, you could just feel it in Alcio. And part of uh, my time in uh, Dharamsala was spent in a remarkable meeting of um, young people, young compassionate leaders from all over the world, from Afghanistan and Ghana and, uh, you know, the Middle East and uh, the global South and the North and Oh, there was such an, including the, the guy, the young Irish guy who was head of Extinction Rebellion in Europe, just a really wild bunch of fabulous young people. But they were um, riven with a kind of common sadness. And um, that sadness was, you know, reflected in the questions that he, uh, that His Holiness was asked by them. And what His Holiness said was that the cure for despair, the cure for futility, the cure for hopelessness is cultivating an altruistic heart. You know, so often it's about us. And His Holiness um, reflected on his years in exile of losing his country, of the deaths of so many in, in Tibet as a result of the Chinese occupation, and how he had managed to transform these tragic circumstances of his life. And this has been, in a way, his clarion call for decades. Compassion. He says, compassion is not a luxury. It is a necessity. And I also thought about Nelson Mandela, 41 years in Robben Island, coming out and inviting his jailer to his inaugural dinner, and Malala, who took a bullet to the head. And their way out of loss was on the path of deeply caring for others. And I thought about the late Paul Farmer, founder of Partners in Health, and the values that he lived 
in serving the disenfranchised. So as we talk about the words that we use, the stories that we tell, the biases that we operate out of, the value of moral remainder and of transforming as well our views and our stories to meet a world so we are resourced and we can support the sense of purpose and meaning and efficacy in how we serve others. And for those who have been in the socially engaged Buddhist training, over the past two years, I think this message <laughs> is coming through again and again. That our moral character that manifests a strong ethic and ethos of care, that manifests altruism and compassion, the strong back, the soft front, that allows us to meet a world that is very uncertain in a way that we can reframe difficult situations generatively and be nimble in the face of extraordinary uncertainty. So in these few minutes we have left, um, I want to invite us again, coming into the two uh, word, uh, the haiku of two words, um, what is your takeaway? What are the two words that, uh, what is your takeaway from today's session? And what do you want to bring out into the world? And in the chat, and uh, we'll begin with you, Frank, two words. To cultivate alliances. Cultivate alliances, beautiful. Wonderful. Raise your hand and we'll also share in the chat. Deep listening, I thou. Compassionate solidarity, altruistic energy. Nice to see you, Nikos. Stay the course with hope. Showing up, softer heart. Continued patience, have courage. Nimble authenticity. Alcio togetherness. Yes, uh, in Rohatsu, I was quoting uh, Cinda, actually, uh, Francis Cook. Everything counts. Everything counts. So, Christiana. Before we dedicate the merit, um, I would, oh, it's not a binary choice, thank you. Don't wait, that's another one. I'd like to invite you into uh, concluding reflections, my beloved friend. I'm so happy I'll see you in February. Oh. I'll see you before, because you're coming on our podcast. Oh, that's right, day after tomorrow. <laughs> day after tomorrow, Rosie Joan on our podcast. Yes. Um, well, uh, I, completely impossible to summarize such a rich conversation, but um, I, I've been sort of in my heart putting this under a, a big, uh, a, a big rubric of continual expansion, because um, we we tend to limit ourselves into our little cocoon of comfort or a little cocoon of the known and uh, the known thoughts, the known behaviors, the known reactions, the known people, et cetera, et cetera. And we tend to cocoon ourselves into that. And I think the challenge here is expansion in all of its uh, in all of its uh, different dimensions, expansion of heart, expansion of uh, of people that we interact with, expansion of compassion, of forgiveness, self-forgiveness really to to be much more uh, intentional about our expansion out there to be more inclusive, more loving, more more embracing of um, of both the, uh, the the challenges that we think first is a challenge, but actually there's a gift there. So expansion for me, 
um, has been sort of a uh, a little uh, golden thread that has run through this whole conversation. And thank you very much, Joan, for inviting me to uh, to be part of your conversation. And I already wrote to Roshi Joy saying, what a beautiful group, lovely, wonderful. Thank you very much to everyone for all of your contributions and your practice. And I want to emphasize the value of curiosity and the importance of imagination and how dropping down into not knowing allows for um, this deep listening, this uh, reflectiveness to happen where we can see the world more deeply. And I also want to just say, uh, I have such faith in humanity. Um, again, working on death row um, with really gnar gnarly characters and also uh, interacting you know, for many decades with people in corporations and politics and in other highfalutin places. And I think His Holiness realization, we are one body. This is a common humanity of like every snowflake is made of water, many different manifestations. And when Christiana spoke about the absolute, being able to really, or the ultimate, being able to see deeply what unites us and also to have the imagination to appreciate the differences. So as we conclude this fourth micro training um, uh, with uh, Christiana and me, uh, thanking uh, our other uh, wonderful John Paul Lederach, uh, Corrine, uh, and uh, Kozan, and um, who was it? What was the second uh, micro training? I'm just blanking on it. Just thanking our socially engaged Buddhist training, this community, now you're a part of it, of social activists and lovers out there in the world to uh, bring um, the best that you have. Everything counts. And I wanna thank Joanne and Noah and Bonnie, the sort of behind the scenes bodhisattvas and our residents here at Upaya that make it all possible. And I just want to dedicate that whatever good you have derived from this time together, whatever moment of insight or whatever piece of joy or connection that we dedicate it to the benefit of all beings, all beings. As we say, may the merit of this practice nourish each thing in all realms and benefit all beings. Thank you, dear friends. Thank you. My beloved Christiana and um, um, our SEBT family will have our final session January 3rd. And always um, your donations make this possible. And also it's the end of the year. So don't hold back. The government gives you a little blessing for being especially generous. So we really need your support. <laughs> We are um, stretching every single day. So thank you. Maybe everybody now turn their gallery on and we'll unmute everybody, Noah. Yeah, I've Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Gracias. Arigato. Arigato. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.